Hi class, I'm gonna talk about the history of policing in the United States. Uh, the focus will be on uh, looking at the history and social function of police within the context of capitalism and class. I'm gonna compare domestic law enforcement to the military industrial complex. I'm gonna say a few things on media and the creation of folk devils from Ukraine and Yemen uh, to the police. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the concept of projection as well as racism as it relates to police. And so, um, and uh, finally I'll end with um, a little talk on society's dependence on the police and why it needs uh, to end. But first some uh, important parts of uh, departure. Um, my attempt is to give a, a rather objective and sober, sober assessment of policing in the United States. Um, I have so-called police blood in my family. Uh, my father was a, a police officer in uh, the Vucare or the French Quarter of New Orleans, as well as uh, other parts of the of the city. Um, I think that it's important to be, you know, as objective as possible when talking about the police and recognize that there's, uh, you know, good and bad people on both sides of the law. There's uh, good criminals and bad cops, just like there's bad cops and good criminals. And so uh, we also have to understand that police don't exist in a vacuum. They exist within a particular historical, uh, under particular historical circumstances. And we have to understand those historical circumstances in order to understand uh, the role of policing today. And as I've said before, it's important not to collapse the institution and the individual. Uh, just because an, an institution might be evil, it doesn't mean that all people that work in that institution are equally evil. In other words, any critique against the criminal justice system, law enforcement and policing in the United States is not a critique on individual police officers or criminal justice professionals in the world. So, you know, we might need police in our society for various reasons, but police do not and cannot reduce crime. Police and crime are generally unrelated, uh, maybe not crime rates, but crime in, in itself. So police cannot meaningfully or significantly reduce or prevent crime um, in the world. And so uh, we also have to understand that we start off with the premise that police are members of the working class who are paid to control other members of the working class. And that's always been the case. A lot of scholars would argue and rightfully so that the function of police uh, today and throughout history has been to uphold class inequality. Or as George Orwell once said, and I'll quote, the educated man pictures a horde of submen wanting only a day's liberty to loot his house, burn his books, and set him to work minding a machine or sweeping out a laboratory. Anything, he thinks, any injustice sooner then let the mob loose. And so despite all the virtue signaling of people, uh, most people, including so-called liberals, uh, they wanna keep the rabble in check just as well. That is the poor and the working classes. And so um, generally people fear uh, the mob, especially in this type of society that we live in that's based on hierarchy and that is based on uh, having pervasive social and economic inequality. Uh, those people that benefit and have privilege, um, despite their virtue signaling, they want to police, they want the police so they can protect their social positions in life. Um, or um, as the song goes, um, love me, I I'm a liberal, uh, Phil Oaks, the author, uh, I cried when they shot Medgar Evers, tears ran down my spine. I cried when they shot Mr. Kennedy, as though I'd lost a father of mine. But Malcolm X got what was coming. He got what he asked for this time. So love me, love me, I'm a liberal. I vote for the Democratic Party. They want the UN to be strong. I attend all the Pete Seeger concerts. He sure gets me singing those songs. And I'll send all the money you ask for, but don't ask me to come along. Sure, once I was young and impulsive, I wore every conceivable pin, even went to socialist meetings, 
learned all the old union hymns. Ah, but I've grown older and wiser, and that's why I'm turning you in. So love me, love me, I'm a liberal. So let's define some terms here. Um, something I would encourage all of you to read in this class, one of the most brilliant essays perhaps ever written is George Orwell's po uh, Politics in the English Language, where he says, and I quote, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. So it's important to know that our politicians and the media pundits uh, that we watch on the news, that they engage in this type of political language to make all of their crimes seem legal, even moral, even self-righteous. And so their lies sound truthful, their murder respectable. And just look at what's going on uh, in the U.S. proxy war with Russia and all the other United States invasions uh, throughout the world, including the ongoing forever wars. Look at all the political language that's used to justify these terroristic acts. And so um, capitalism, today, American capitalism, we have to define our, our term of what is capitalism. It's a term that most people don't even know anymore. Uh, to capitalism, communism, these become lost words. Um, according to Orwell, um, you know, these words have been so overused, they're more cliche-ish and they don't even mean anything anymore. So people just say communism or Russian spy uh, for anyone who disagrees with orthodox liberal ways of thinking. And so it's important to define what we mean. And today, American capitalism is composed of a tiny cabal of corporate elites who control the wealth in our society and make most of the political and economic decisions for the entire country. In fact, for the entire society. It translates to the end of any meaningful democracy, which we do not have democracy in the United States that was gone decades ago. We now exist in what's called a corporate oligarchy where a few of the richest billionaires of the world control the wealth, thought, and decision-making in our society. In other words, we have been disenfranchised and our government today works to serve the interests of the capitalist corporate oligarchy ruling class. In fact, today, we no longer really have capitalism. We have uh, what uh, most economists refer to as neoliberalism, which is based on massive tax cuts for the rich, welfare for the rich programs, the crushing of trade unions, and the right for workers to assemble, deregulation of the, econ of the economy for corporate profit, privatization of social services and institutions that once belonged to the people, and the outsourcing and competition for public services that left the American worker high and dry. Through the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, neoliberal policies are imposed without any democratic consent, without any of our say-so, throughout much of the world. And this the purpose of our government today is no longer to serve the interests of the people or to protect the people, but rather to serve the interests of the corporate elite. In neoliberalism, government serves to enrich the rich, meaning the corporate elite. And neoliberalism, neoliberalism is just another form of corporate oligarchy where corporations dictate domestic and international social policy. And we now live in a fully neoliberal type of society. Or as Chris Hedges once said, the billionaire class gets corporate monopolies, union busting, privatized state and municipal services, including public education, revoke government regulations, especially environmental regulation, and can engage in a virtual tax boycott. And that's exactly what's happened. The burden of paying for society has been left to us, the employed class, while the employer class, the billionaire class, pays almost nothing. In other words, we live in an age of class warfare where the ruling classes are waging class warfare against the people. And the police in large part, along with the military industrial complex, serve the interests of the corporate elite. The nation state similarly serves the interests of corporate power. Now we have to design policing. What exactly is policing and law enforcement in our society and how do we define it? No, policing is the system of law enforcement used to uphold the rules and wishes of the corporate and political elite who serve the interests of global capital. 
That is, the social function of police is to serve the interests of the powerful and keep the rabble, the employees, in check. Their job, ultimately, is to uphold class inequality. And so the police, they do the dirty work of the rich and the powerful to subjugate and control the poor and the working classes. Now, what is this idea of class consciousness? Um, and of course, there's a relationship between wealth and consciousness. That is, those people that own the wealth of a society also control the media. They control what people think. And so it's interesting how the ruling class, they're not only a class um, uh, in themselves, but for themselves. They are aware of themselves as a class, and they operate in solidarity to push social policies that represent their class interests. But in the United States, where we live in a class or caste-based society, um, we've been taught to divide ourselves based on race, class, ethnicity, documentation, uh, or other socially manufactured types of uh, divisions, uh, including uh, identity politics. And so um, as a result, as the employee class, we have uh, little to no class consciousness. We are divided. And it's this class division that we have among ourselves that allows our uh, political and economic ruling elite to wage effectively this class warfare against us with reckless abandon. Indeed, even among the so-called liberal classes, cancy culture, multiculturalism, identity politics replaces the true material uh, circumstances of our lives like class, capitalism, and militarism, the things that we are supposed to focus on. Even the liberals call for a permanent war economy today, surprisingly more so than the Republicans, to fund the military industrial complex, including billions of dollars currently sent to Ukraine that go into the hands of weapons manufacturers such as Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, while so many of our brothers and sisters here in the United States are homeless or live paycheck to paycheck or have to deal with uh, high tuition costs or high health care costs. So let's look at the history and function of policing in the United States within the context of capitalism. And so this is basically the relationship between police and capitalism. As I've said before, police are hired members of the working class to help oppress or control or otherwise keep in check other members of the working class. And so there's also a relationship between domestic law enforcement uh, and capitalism. And let's look at the history of the United States here. Uh, during the period of westward expansionism, manifest destiny, and colonialism, who do you think it was exterminating the Native American population as we were, as the United States was colonizing uh, much of North America? It was the police. One of the first roles of police in the United States history was to help commit genocide against the indigenous populations here in the Americas. Um, if you look at uh, Engels, who wrote about the conditions of the working class in England, uh, workers during the Industrial Revolution, they suffered from extremely low wages, extremely poor living conditions, even worse than their pre-industrial peers, and they lived in more unhealthy and unpleasant environments. And what was the role of the police? Uh, well, uh, to make sure people went to work. Work was so awful. It was so exploitative and it paid such uh, low wages and it was just a nightmare for so many workers that they would rather be poor uh, and starving than go to work. But they made poverty so awful in England and so awful in the United States that people reluctantly uh, went to work instead. And in fact, they criminalized people that wouldn't go work in these awful, inhumane, dehumanizing conditions. In fact, that's where vagrancy laws and loiter loitering laws came from to make sure that people uh, went to work. And if people uh, didn't go to work because of awful work conditions and poverty wages, it was the police that was there to beat them on the head and put them in prison and criminalize them if they didn't go work for their capitalist masters. And of course, uh, there were people that uh, protested against slavery and thought that slavery was evil, especially the slaves. And who was there to reinforce the institution of slavery? 
You guessed it. It was the police. The police were there to uh, do the bidding for the slave owners and the slave masters to make sure that just like the poor uh, white people had to go to work in awful conditions, they made sure that black people and those that were stolen from Africa uh, obeyed their uh, masters and their owners. If they didn't, the role of police was to make sure they did and through violence if necessary. And so police have always been used to um, serve the interest of the owning class, whether it's slave owners or the uh, industrial uh, bourgeois colonizing and exploiting uh, workers. And then of course, anytime human beings have ever fought for civil rights, anytime human beings have fought for women's rights, animal rights, environmental rights, or against war, who do you think it was there to beat them on the head and to criminalize them? It was the police. Every time there has been social movements for human rights in our society and civil rights in our society, the police have always been there to uphold the interests of the capitalists and to beat, brutalize, injure, and incarcerate human beings fighting for their rights. That has been the history of policing. It has been consistent. None other, uh, another good example would be um, labor unions. Police have always been there to crush the rights of workers who fought against capitalists when they fought for uh, decent wages, safe working conditions. Anytime workers have fought for their interests, the police were always there to criminalize those workers and to punish them. One good example would be the Pink Pinkerton National Detective Agency. It was founded as a private police force in Chicago in 1850. For over 75 years, the Pinkerton National Detective Agency terrorized union workers trying to organize. The Pinkerton private police force carried out acts of class warfare on behalf of the capitalists. They enthusiastically and viciously tried to destroy the labor movement, police strike breakers on behalf of the capitalists. For decades throughout the Civil War and beyond, the Pinkertons committed acts of violence on striking and protesting workers, often committing massacres, protecting the interests of capital using any means necessary. So for example, in the Homestead Steel Strike, if you remember your American history, a work stoppage due to Carnegie uh, reducing wages at the Homestead plant, at Carnegie Steel Plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania, turned into one of the most violent episodes in the labor, American labor struggle in the eight, late 1800s. Hundreds of men from the T Pinkerton Detective Agency exchanged gunfire and killed workers and townspeople. The Pennsylvania uh, militia eventually took over the Homestead Plant and uh, replaced the organizing workers with non-union strike breakers. While Andrew Carnegie was off in Scotland, enjoying a vacation. The police were doing his dirty work, killing union workers. Leaders of the union were eventually prosecuted and Carnegie succeeded in keeping unions out of his plans. And police have historically done this type of dirty work for the corporate elite as the rich enjoyed their vacations abroad with all their yachts and all their jets and all their planes and all their resorts. The Lowell Still Meal Girls um, explained uh, once, uh, I'll tell you about them. In fact, I'll give you a quote from them in a moment, uh, but it was Chomsky who explained uh, how, what workers thought of wage work in the mid 19th century. And his quote is this, um, this is Noam Chomsky, uh, the most quoted living intellectual in the world today and the uh, third uh, uh, most quoted intellectual in human history. He says, at one time in the United States in the mid 19th century, Working for wage labor was considered not very different from chattel slavery. That was the slogan of the Republican Party, the banner under which Northern workers went to fight in the Civil War. We're against chattel slavery and wage slavery. There were workers in Lowell, Massachusetts saying this around that time. It took a long time to drive into people's heads the idea that it is legitimate to rent yourself. Now, that's unfortunately pretty much accepted. And if you think about work today, many of us here want to get a job. What we have to do is sell our minds and sell our bodies in exchange for a wage uh, to a master, what we call an employer, which is, of course, our master. So why is this accepted? 
Well, it's partly because of police forcing people to accept it. And so who were those Lowell workers that Chomsky was talking about? The women of Lowell understood the importance of labor unions and that labor unions were extremely helpful to avoid becoming fully uh, slaves to a corporate system. These women sang this song during the strike of 1836, fighting against industrial exploitation and oppression. They said, oh, isn't it a pity such a pretty girl as I should be sent to the factory to pine away and die. Oh, I cannot be a slave. I will not be a slave for I'm so fond of liberty. I cannot be a slave. We can all sing that song pretty much today. Again, the police are members of the working class hired to control and subjugate other members of the working class. Police have been and continue to be used for suppressing the working classes. They are continue to be used today to suppress labor unions, to, pre uh, to oppress uh, black rights, to fight against people who are fighting for uh, environmental rights, social justice, animal rights, etc. You name it. When people fight for their rights to stop pipelines and fracking and drilling, it's police that are there to beat them over the head, to tase them, and to spray chemicals in their eyes, to put them in cuffs, to put them in chains, and bring them to their cages. Police, again, in short, are paid to do the dirty work of the corporate oligarchy and the political elite. And what the police do domestically, the military industrial complex does internationally. The American military is used to protect and fight for the interests of capitalists abroad. As the highly decorated military general who fought in the Mexican revolution and World War II, Smedley Butler put it in 19, or Butler, Smedley Butler put it in 1935, and you should go check out his uh, work, War is a Racket. He says, and I quote, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service. And during that period, I spent most of my time as a high class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. I bought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interest in 1960s. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. And he says, to end war, we must take the profit out of war because it's the only reason why the United States goes to war around the world is for corporate profit. Why have we been in war in Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia, and terrorizing those people, bombing their civilian centers, bombing their hospitals, and calling, counting um, you know, a huge uh, death toll? corporate profit. All this is done to expand capitalistic accumulation abroad and support the military industrial complex in the U.S. economy that relies on permanent war. As Julian Assange said, the goal is not to win these forever wars in the Middle East, but rather to use these Middle Eastern countries to transfer money out of the hands of the U.S. taxpayers and to the hands and into the hands of the transnational security elite and the military industrial complex. In other words, the purpose of these forever wars is not to protect us or to spread democracy. It's rather used to take money out of our, the employees out of our pockets and give it to an, uh, the largest upward transfer of wealth that this world has ever seen. It's to take our tax money and to give it to our wealthy. That is the purpose of war. It's for profit and no other reason. So just like the purpose of the uh, criminal uh, justice system is to make money from US taxpayers to wage class warfare on the American people, 
while also enriching the powerful corporations that benefit from the prison industrial complex. And the purpose of the military industrial complex is to produce endless capital accumulation for corporate power. Or as Chris Hedges puts it, war demonizes though in the Middle East, Russia or China, who are blamed for the economic and social debacles that inevitably get worse. War diverts the rage engendered by a dysfunctional state towards immigrants, people of color, feminists, liberals, artists, anyone who does not identify as a heterosexual, the press, Antifa, Jews, Muslims, Russians, or Asians. Take your pick. It's a bigot smogs board. Every item is on a menu at fair game, end quote. So now, why do we engage in such evil? Why do we wage wars with strangers and murder them? Why do we deport our brothers and sisters? Why do we lock up our fellow brothers and sisters in cages? How do we come to demonize people? Well, this has to do with demonization and the manufacturing of folk devils. In order to kill, murder, exploit, torture, or as Obama said, uh, torture some folks, cage and deport people, we must first dehumanize them. The media largely plays a large role in the interest of capital by creating or manufacturing folk devils in the process of dehumanization that allows us to engage in evil. Or as Glenn Greenwald, uh, the journalist puts it, the most shameless liars from the Bush Cheney administration have enjoyed great success in the liberal media. That is because serial deceit is not a liability for a thriving career in corporate journalism, but a vital asset provided the lies are in service of ruling class policies. Actually, I would argue that not only for journalists, but for many academics today as well. We have something similar to what George Orwell referred to as two minutes of hate, where the corporate media manipulates our thoughts and emotions. They manufacture consent, as Chomsky would put it, and create our monsters and social pariahs, both here and abroad, that allows us to warmonger, torture, and imprison from immigrants, from the Irish who are thought as Celtic ape-like creatures that could never assimilate into the decent white man's culture to Mexicans. In fact, if you look at all the words that was used to depict Irish immigrants when they first come into the United States, those same exact words are used to depict Mexicans today. Or who else has been scapegoated? Drug users, homeless people, political dissidents, Muslims and Arabic speakers, inner city black youths, Trumpers and Republicans, uh, those people that stormed the White House on January 6th, it goes on and on and on. To the people we kill and torture in the American forever wars from Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia, to the Palestinian people, to the people of Cuba and Venezuela and Nicaragua, where the US continues to kill and destroy the lives of millions of people for capitalistic accumulation. And of course, the United States, just like they invaded Cuba, they're itching to invade uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua as well. So dehumanization and the creation of folk devils is what allows us to commit acts of murder, war, deportation, enslavement, which is ongoing today, look at the 13th Amendment, and imprisonment. So dehumanization also creates worthy and unworthy victims. We all, most people feel all the sympathy for Ukrainian people that are indeed suffering from awful war crimes, yet uh, who really feels uh, for those people that are getting terrorized uh, in Yemen and uh, in Afghanistan and uh, uh, Iraq, or as Madam Albright, uh, when asked if uh, the embargo and all of American foreign policy directed towards Iraq that killed uh, hundreds of thousands of children, if that was worth it, she said, yes, it was worth it. These are worthy victims. And so how do some people become worthy victims and unworthy victims? So I wanna switch to, uh, turn a, a little bit. Um, there's another process that we go about demonizing people besides uh, the collusion between um, politicians and media and manufacturing folk devils that we blame for larger social problems. But it's also projection, um, uh, the demonization of our own shadow. We project the worst aspects of ourselves onto people. Carl Jung's concept of projection um, explains how we cast our insecurities and the most repugnant aspects of ourselves onto the faces of others. 
In other words, we cast our shadows onto the faces of strangers and we project the worst aspects of who we are onto other people. And then we end up hating uh, those other people when really we're hating ourselves simply because we cannot admit the most repugnant aspects of who we are. So we project that onto other people and then hate those people for um, the shadows that we project onto them. And Russia is a good example. Russia illegally invades the Ukraine. Oh, the United States illegally invaded uh, and invades uh, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Somalia, among many others, and funds its genocide in Yemen. They're itching to invade other countries like uh, Venezuela and Iran. Yet, uh, we're the ones engaged in war crimes. Russia blows up soft targets like medical facilities to demoralize the enemy. Well, the United States engages in international war crimes, killing unarmed civilians, blowing up medical facilities, torturing folks, and sanctioning embargoes that kill millions of innocent women and children. Some political observers have pointed out that every evil Russia has committed, the United States has done many times over, yet we project our shadow onto Russia. Let's take another example, Trump. We cast our ugly shadows onto Trump, while members of the Democratic Party do much worse than Trump. Bill Clinton on immigration, here's one of his quotes. And I quote, all Americans, not only in the states most heavily affected, but in every place in this country are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or illegal immigrants. The public service they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more by hiring a record number of new border guards, by deporting twice as many illegal criminals as ever before by cracking down on illegal hiring, by barring welfare benefits to illegal aliens. In the budget I will present to you, we will try to do more to speed the deportation of illegal aliens who are arrested for crimes to better identify illegal aliens who are in the workplace. Yet, that was Trump? Nope, that was Clinton. Obama, he dropped more bombs and deported more people than Trump did in his first term. Biden and Clinton, uh, their 1994 crime bill created the age of mass incarceration and they destroyed more black lives than the KKK could have ever have dreamed of. That's right, Biden and Clinton are more dangerous to black Americans than the KKK. And Biden today continues these forever wars and continues sending troops to Somalia Killing and murdering black people have done no harm to us. As Hedges states, the establishment oligarchs now united in the Democratic Party distrust Donald Trump. He commits the heresy of questioning the sanctity of the American empire. Trump derided the invasion of Iraq as a big fat mistake. He promised to, quote unquote, to keep us out of endless war. Trump was repeatedly questioned about his relationship with Vladimir Putin. Putin was a killer, one interviewer told him. There are a lot of killers, Trump retorted. You think our country's so innocent? Trump dared to speak a truth that was to be forever unspoken. The militarist had sold out the American people, end quote. And Trump today continues to call for the end of the war. Says if he was elected president, they would end the war. I'm no fan of Trump or any other politician, but wow, I would never have thought that it was the Democrats that was the war mongering party and not so much or as much the Republicans. So corporations have bought the American government and it's two ruling parties, the Democrat and Republican parties. And unfortunately, mainstream journalists and a coward class of academics concern with careerism and status, either scapegoat Trump and his followers, remain silent, or keep their heads down. And let's take another example of projection. What about the police? Many Americans project their own repressed racism onto police. And so those people that say that all cops are racist or misogynist, perhaps they're uh, placing their own repressed racism and their own ugly shadows on into the faces of police and then hitting police for their own racism. And I would ask to say that as a society, 
it's time that we stop relying on the police. The only people we need the police, but police can be a, help, a helping hand. And in uh, my latest book, Human Rights Policing, Reimagining Law Enforcement in the 21st Century, I argue that we need to transform police from a social control agency and an agency that enforces law to a human rights agency that protects the human rights of all people, especially the most institutionally vulnerable people. We rely on police to solve all of our problems, keep us safe from the so-called rabble, and we call them the moment we feel threatened and then throw them under the bus when they can't solve all of our problems, when they do the dirty work that we refuse to do ourselves. While many of us live in suburbs and in safe neighborhoods, a proper distance away from Hillary Clinton's super predators of inner city youths, the police do the dirty work of subjugating the poor and working classes, literally wrestling them to the ground and putting them safely away in our cages when they threaten our safety. And then we project our own racism onto them. Maybe it's time that we look inwardly. Maybe it's time that we look at our own shadows that we reject onto the police. If we actually wanna make our community safer, let's stop calling police racist while sending them off to do the dirty work we refuse to do ourselves. Let's create perhaps a more equal society. Let's solve the problems of relative deprivation rooted in social inequalities that are the true causes of crime and discontent. Let's stop relying on police and create structural solutions to our problems. Let's start taking responsibility to protect ourselves by solving the problems of poverty, homelessness, and social exclusion. Police can be the helping hand on all of this. And so I want to just say uh, a few things on, on racism and policing. You know, and it's very interesting that today you, can have the, uh, you can't have the wrong cultural attitudes about black and brown people, but you can bomb them and you can kill them with impunity, just like we do in all of these forever wars, just like Obama and Biden did in these forever wars, killing people with impunity. This is absurd. And all of this empty virtue signaling is even beyond, beyond absurd. It's sinister. Who cares what people think? It matters most what people do. People have the right to think however they want to think. And they have the right to feel however they want to feel towards any group of people. And it's not our job to get into the few cubic centimeters in, our skull, in their skull and tell them what to think or how to think. And it's not your job to be the thought police or the speech police. So stop trying to tell people what to think and what to feel. I think the problem of telling people what to think and what to feel and cancel them, this is some strange, perverse form of mental illness that needs to be stopped. And I'll give you an example. I have a good friend named Bobby in the fire department. And uh, Bobby in the fire department, every single day, he saves uh, people's lives. Well, maybe not every single day, but often he saves people's lives. Um, and I've personally seen him walking through the streets of the French Quarter in New Orleans, the fireman in New Orleans, where he sees, even when he's off duty, he sees people passed out, drunks, and he'll go out of his way to make sure that people's heads are into the street uh, where they might get hurt by a car, and it'll put them on the sidewalk even when he gets urine uh, all over him. And I've seen him do this time and time again. My friend Bobby, who's a staunch right-wing conservative, has saved more black and brown lives than all the virtue signaling liberal professors that I've ever come across. And so what do you think is more important? The virtue signaling and the, the pathetic display of possessing the right type of cultural attitudes are actually saving the lives of people, actually protecting the human rights of people. You tell me is what's more important, saving lives, protecting human rights, or virtue signaling it? Look. Humans are inherently bigoted and prejudiced and culture shapes the form that this takes. We're all racist and bigots and prejudiced. It's innate within us. So instead, let's talk about perhaps uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's concept of the double consciousness. And I'll say a few things on that. When you read W. Du Bois, uh, and he talks about this double consciousness that he had as being a, uh, he's a famous sociologist, by the way, um, he talked about uh, you know, the double consciousness, the feelings of two-ness that he experienced of being a black man in America, a black intellectual, but also being an American, and that these were two conflicting identities that can never merge together. And people always, no matter uh, how well he proved himself as an American, what a great scholar and a beautiful thinker he was, no matter how much he was an American and an intellectual, he was always still a black man never quite American. And so he was always made to feel like the outsider. 
the inferior, the other. And I've thought about it. My family has experienced this as well, where we have this sense of cubanidad, this sense of Cubanness, uh, but also this sense of being an American. And these are two conflicting identities that can never really uh, be simpatico because we're always made, no matter how much we prove ourselves to be the outsider, inferior, the other. Then when I thought about how my family's always experienced this sense of Tunis, I thought about he, even me as a professor, how I've done this to other people, maybe poor, white, rural people. Uh, at least I've done this when I was growing up. And I realized I can be a jerk too. I'm just as liable to be prejudiced and biased as well. The point isn't to repress our biasnesses and to repress our prejudices, is to be aware of it, to scrutinize it, to understand it, to examine it, and only then can we change our behavior. And so this is a good lesson, I think, for police and for all of us to understand how sometimes we are made the other, the outsider inferior, and how at other times we do this to others. And we want to make sure that we are aware of it so we don't do those types of things. I think police and academics and journalists and all of us, anyone who works in a criminal justice system or any thinking thoughtful member of society should be aware of this. And last, I'll say that you know, human rights Although it was written in 1948, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights as the first real expression of human rights in our society, human rights simply exists as a concept and still a relatively new concept, but has never been meaningfully or significantly um, practice today. Look around the world and all the suffering that we create for, uh, uh, you know, all across the planet, our forever wars, our social exclusion, denying people of health care, having embedded indentured servants, uh, having corporations exploit people as they rape and pillage our own planet. We have no real actual human rights in our society. We're almost completely void of human rights, almost in every social sphere of social life. And so our job is to bring back human rights, to make it a practice, to make it a reality. Stop virtue signaling, stop talking about it, and let's talk about uh, engaging in real collective action at a grassroots level, protecting our own communities and making sure that human rights becomes practiced. This will be another video that I'll uh, make on how we can actually turn, transform human rights from a concept to something that we actually practice. And I believe that one of the things that we can do is actually take one of the most highly unlikely institutions, law enforcement, and transform that institution from an institution of social control, break it from its history, break it from its past, and have law enforcement be a real vision of the future. Have law enforcement be the number one domestic human rights organization in the world that exists to protect the human rights of all people. Only then can we reimagine a new world that works in the benefit of all of us. That's it for today. Thank you very much.